So business model transformation means a lot of different things to a lot of people. It's complex. It's not easy. It's tough to, to implement. It's easy to talk about. It's easy to say, well, you know, see how Adobe transformed into being a SaaS company, you know, and it, we saw that transformation. We saw how difficult it was. It's not maybe that hard anymore, but at the same time, I feel like we need to level set a little bit. Yeah. What does business model transformation really mean? What does it mean to you, Satya? Let's start with that. Yeah, like you said, uh, business model transformation is a very overly used term. If you ask me my definition, uh, if you break it down or decompose it down to the lowest level, there are three elements. One is uh, what it is that we are selling to the customer, who are we selling it to, and how do we sell and monetize? It's clearly that. I mean, you can apply this framework to any industry, any vertical, any segment, and it'll just work. In the VMware context, uh, VMware has been selling or what's selling perpetual products or licenses for the longest time. That was a product we're selling. And we are selling the product uh, through predominantly a two-tier distribution network to reach our end customers. And uh, the way we monetize it um, is by you know, handing a price book to a distributor. The distributor will take the price book and give it to the reseller. The reseller will place an order and order will, orders will get fulfilled. Now, VMware has pivoted its uh, journey from becoming a pure play perpetual company to a SaaS and subscription company. If we apply these three elements in principle, then what has happened? How have we transformed the company from a business model standpoint is, is the following. From a product standpoint, we stopped selling, or we are stopping, to, we're going to stop selling li licensed product. Instead of that, we're going to offer software as a service or a subscription type of offers to, mm -hmm. to the customers. That's a big shift. I mean, I don't want to like put it too fine point on it, but as that's a, a monumental shift in sort of that business model because that changes mindsets. You know, I don't, I'm not going to get us, you know, too off track. I know because I won't let you finish your thought, but I think that is definitely something that underscores that's a massive tectonic shift from especially a company this size to be able to go from, you know, <clears throat> off the shelf, you bought it for two years to we're going to continue to have a subscription model service and, and that really drives, I think, a lot of the activity around, you know, some of the other pillars that you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is, it, is, um, it, is, it is a lot easier said than done. You're Adobe example, and every company has struggled through this journey, whether, uh, um, you know, Adobe can claim that uh, it was an overnight shift, mm. but that overnight shift took them five years. Yes, it was okay. five-year overnight you success. Can only, you can only <laughs> yeah. get this uh, um, insights by talking to people that have gone through this journey. And Adobe took a stance of making a dramatic shift from a way of doing business to completely doing SaaS and sub and not selling any perpetual licenses whatsoever. They could do that because they were very much um, a consumer-centric company. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about uh, VMware, uh, which generally plays in the enterprise space, it was not an easy decision. In other words, um, we couldn't just you know, switch from perpetual or license-driven business model to SaaS and sub. It, yeah. it, it couldn't be done. It had, a, it had major implications on financials, mm -hmm. on products themselves, readiness within the company, as well as customers' adoption to uh, this product or services that are running critical workload. We couldn't do that from, from a VMware standpoint. So it had to be a gradual journey from, okay, we, we want to start. It's going to take us three to four to five years, and we're going to slowly graduate customers that are willing or cloud-ready from a perpetual starting model to a SaaS and sub model. Yeah, and then what was that like for you, uh, Rupa, to, to go through that tectonic shift? What was that, you know, with, you know, within some of the framework that you talked about, um, Satya, how is it like your relationship, maybe you talked a little bit of kind of like how, how what's the relationship between, you know, the, the, the product management and your team and how the two work together and what that, what that shift was like for you and your team? Sure, sure. So as Satya was talking about, you know, his team works on, what aspects of the transformation, what needs to be transformed. Um, and he works with different products and understands and then, you know, tries to come up with the big list of requirements in terms of this is how we're going to transform. And what my team is responsible for is to implement that. So uh, what the team is trying to do is we are trying to build a unified commerce platform on which every single VMware product is going to transact in the SaaS model and we're going to service all of our customers through that one unified platform. That's the transformation journey. With, with that transformation, it's pretty much like, uh, you know, even though it's a business model transformation, 
it's every function and every aspect of what my team does is going to transform. Yeah, no, I think that's good because like the way starting from how do we plan, how do we design, how do we implement, how do we deploy, how do we support the customers, every aspect of it is going to change. It's going to transform, you know. Mm -hmm. So that is the that is the change that 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 we are talking about. So uh, Satya's team comes up with the requirement, my team implements it. So we work so closely, like more like a two in a box, and that way we understand and we implement it. And the key is like again uh, how quickly we can transform and how quickly we can realize the business value yeah and we say are the annual recurring the, revenue so you had yes. annual recurring revenue targets yes. on your activity and that's that is no small thing Absolutely. that is that is tough and you talked about how all the different aspects needed to change talk about some of the the ways in which i know that the momentum of the organization can be very strong in a certain direction and especially after the company's been around for a long time what were some of the ways where some things, some things I imagine needed to just be broken and then rebuilt. Some things needed to be shifted. Some things need to be directed. Talk about some of the nuance because I think that's what's important here is that the, the, the values and the nuance of how you approached each of those changes that were driven by that SaaS transformation. Yeah, it's, um, it's, um, that's, that's a good point. Um, in, in the SaaS uh, and subscription world, uh, we call that as a new income statement, which is um, everything is ARR. Um, in, in the traditional world, it was about bookings and revenue, but in a SaaS and subscription world, we had to shift our income statement from that to annual recurring revenue. As in, I'm running annual recurring revenue, I, I add a bunch of customers, I have churn, I lose a customer, a bunch of customers, and then I have what, you know, the new version of ARR. We really had to pivot into that model when it came to prioritization. So consider uh, for context, right? We run platform teams. So we, VMware has about uh, 50 cloud services and growing. So we have the multi-cloud suite, we have the cloud native suite, we have NDJ computing, we have edge computing, and we have a whole slew of management softwares. Every single product and service within VMware portfolio runs differently. So when it comes to selling or billing or collecting, they all are, they all have different characteristics, but we are one company and we serve to one set of customers. The challenge becomes, how do you normalize what it is the products are doing and how do you create a consistent and frictionless experience for our customers and partners? So what we did from a product management standpoint, we applied certain principles, which is, okay, is it driving my ARR? Mm -hmm. Is it going to create good customer experience? Is it going to increase my deal or transactional velocity? Applying that uniformly across all requirements gave us a list of prioritized stack rank candidates. You see that in every company, whether you're running a product organization or a platform organization. Apply the vectors in an uniform way and you have a list of things that you need to go work on. So Satya, that makes sense. And from an execution standpoint, what does that look like from you and your team once you pick that up and once you start getting that executed? What is What are some of the requirements, especially when it comes to you know a business perspective? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once we understand the prioritized set of requirements, the challenge that my face, my team faces is how can we be more agile and how can we really deliver, you know, be nimble and deliver as quickly as possible, as optimally as possible so that the quicker business value realization can happen. So the team focused on three fundamental aspects of how we can be more agile, right? Number one is the mindset itself. Because the teams are used to delivering, I need some coding changes. I need new payment methods. Delivering those changes are very different than telling, deliver an end-to-end -end business model change that is spanning across entire lead to cash ecosystem. So, because yeah, ultimately so you have that to, big overarching goal, but you have to then break it into exactly. bite-sized parts. You have to pick in executable pieces that then have outcomes that can be measured. Did I do it well? Absolutely. Are we moving forward? Are we, and then do we have to change too? And so, I mean, because all of that, I mean, the complexity around that is, is, is tremendous too. And I imagine you probably met with a little bit of resistance. Yes. And and how 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 was how did you have to recraft the way that you approach things and the way you you yes. worked with the team to to make it happen? Yeah, one fundamental way we addressed it is definitely the mindset change. We had to we knew that we had to accelerate on the implementation, but we knew that you know changing taking time and changing the mindset was extremely important because the team has to know how do we really change the way we think in order for us to design the system for future, in order to implement it, the planning, collaboration with the team 
uh, and the design, development, and the deployment, all of that had to change. So the mindset shift had to happen, and we focused enormous, uh, you know, energy in changing that mindset from prod project delivery to product delivery with the SaaS mindset. I think that's fascinating too, because it seems like it was less of you don't have to change tool sets, you don't have to change technology, and maybe in some cases, you know, you're you're not changing the relationships with certain individuals, but you have to change mindsets. That that's, it's fascinating too that that's really like okay, you have these people, you have this expertise, you have this technology, but really, it's the way you think, the way you process, the workflow. That's what's got to change, and that's 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 some of the hardest part. It's and, very very hard yeah. because. Uh, you know, the way, especially designing transformation will not happen over and over again, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's, it's a one of an opportunity for us to transform and build the system from scratch, which means we have to build the system today for tomorrow or the future to come. So the, this, this, the design and the way we think in terms of how am I going to make the system a lot more uh, resilient? Uh, scalable, supportable, uh, upgradable, mm -hmm. you know, all of these aspects and the security, let's not, you know, forget it, right? Yes. You know, the security it's will become, it. security yeah. and complaints becomes the center of everything. And we have to focus on these things because we don't want our developers to keep on thinking about these aspects. This has to come as a fundamental thing, right? And that way they can focus on business feature development. So most of my developers' effort has to go towards business features than Keep on working into, am I, you know, doing this and you know, going back and revisiting, you know, my system is not resilient, my system is not available. Whereas the design itself should happen in such a manner that, you know, that's, that's, that's given. That's fun. That becomes the foundation. And then, uh, you know, rest onwards, you know, everybody focuses on business features. Nice. And so, I think one of the things that is inherent in all those different pieces is risk. And it's, okay, we're doing something new. Or I said, everyone's risk. Um, I, my job might change, my f function might change. I'm seeing risk. How are you, how are you looking at, at each of those factors from the person to the process to, you know, the business outcome? And how are you addressing risk at each of those stages from, I mean, from the beginning, such yeah. when you're designing this? Yeah. Well, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you start at the highest level, uh, then uh, there are a few things that had to happen. First of all, the company had to come up with a, with a business strategy. That translated into, you know, what are the business models that will have to be changed to support that shift? Now, going back to my answer, uh, you know, what are we selling? What are we selling it to? And how we sell and monetize? Those parameters had to be changed. So the next level down was, what are the capabilities that will need to be developed to support the business model shift? That includes your process, policy, people, and so on. Um, I'm really, really extremely proud to say this. And as compared to last year, our throughput has increased five times. That's five times. And it is not just by adding the capacity. It is not just by making our, our teams work 24 by 7. Yeah. It is by improving the product productivity of each and every engineer by giving them the right tools and technology, by giving them the right methodology, and by giving them the right mission. Right. And then the mindset and that is all resulting. It took it took us some time, though. You know, of course, there were resistance initially. And, you know, it took us some time for us to kind of bring everybody into the team, into that the journey and that same alignment. But once that happened, as Satya was telling, you know, compared to last year till now, it's like an amazing curve for us. Right? You know, in terms of the productivity, in terms of the, just the just the business adoption, in terms of the way we are delivering. How smooth the releases are going. It's just, it's just. Yeah. Uh, Building on what Rupa is talking about, there was definitely uh, some resistance from the team because we have been living in this ever changing landscape. The team's questions were, what if we deliver something that is not going to be useful because maybe the models have shifted? So we had to really adopt the minimum viable product type of mentality, which is let's not go build a Cadillac yet mm. until we know that the skateboard is working. So <laughs> that, that eased the tension, which is, okay, I want to make sure that I'm building something um, that has some traction. And if it has traction, I'm going to continue to build on that. Get a, take a skateboard to a bicycle, to a car, and so on. Yeah. Right? And get constant feedback constant and iterate. Feedback, iterate constant yeah, and, yeah. and we introduce a, a closed service ownership, which is if you own a feature, you own the feature for life. Oh, wow. That included the product managers yeah. and engineering It's like you break it, you fix it, you build it, you own it. You own it and you <laughs> and run it. Yes, right? you own it and you run it. Yeah, and that's what it. motivates the team, right? You know, uh, if they keep on delivering and if nobody's using it, 
So it, that's the that's the most new motivation that I can think of for the developers. Yeah. The minute they realize, you know, business is using it and you are getting some value, that motivates them to deliver faster. Mm-hmm. You know, so that is what has happened over time. You know, before we kept delivering, at, but business adoption was quite low. But, you know, we had to focus on that. So there are various levers. You know, we focus on one and then we, you know, pick another, you know. So for all the levers to kind of come to an optimum level, that's the journey. You know, that's going to take some time. Uh, that's fabulous. And so I think at this point, um, I want to thank you guys. This has been a fabulous conversation. If people want to learn more about what each of you are doing, where you're going to be, what you're working on, where can they find you in the in the digital world? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn at a minimum. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> or follow my Twitter handle, although I don't tweet that much. Okay. Same what's with your, me. What's, what's your Twitter handle? You want to share that? <laughs> we can cut it out too. <laughs> no Same idea. with me okay. and mine is uh, Rupa Sundaraj. Okay. And, and Rupa, can we find you on LinkedIn as well? Yes, of course. Excellent. <laughs> Anytime. Well, <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us.